Hey listeners, this is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today has so many fascinating bits because Spencer is such a fascinating guy. I particularly enjoy the discussion of three public opinion surveys that Spencer ran, which comes at the end of the show. I listen to a lot of podcasts myself and always do it using an app on my phone so that I can choose whatever speed I like. Uh, when I realized I could listen to shows at double speed, I started saving uh, several hours a week. If you want, you can get this show on your phone by searching for 80,000 hours in your podcasting app and subscribing. That's 80,000 as a number. As always, you can apply for free coaching if you want to work on any of the problems discussed in this episode. And the blog post with this episode has a full transcript and links to articles discussed in the show. And now I bring you Spencer Greenberg. Today, I'm speaking with Spencer Greenberg. Spencer is a polymath with many interests and achievements. To start with, Spencer is an entrepreneur. He founded Sparkwave, a startup foundry which creates novel software products designed to solve problems in the world, such as scalable care for depression and technology for improving social science. He also founded clearerthinking.org, which offers free tools and training programs that have been used by over 150,000 people designed to help improve decision-making and reduce biases in people's thinking. Spencer is also a mathematician with a PhD in applied math from NYU with a specialty in machine learning. Previously, he co-founded a quantitative investment firm where he designed algorithms to make daily predictions about thousands of stocks. Spencer's work has been featured by major media outlets such as the Wall Street Journal, The Independent, Lifehacker, Gizmodo, Fast Company, and The Financial Times. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Spencer. Thanks for having me. So we plan to talk about a number of the projects uh, Spencer has on the boil and what we can learn from his experience. First, though, uh, whenever I talk to you, I'm always impressed with what you've managed to get done lately. So what are you doing these days, Spencer? Well, so at Sparkwave, um, as you mentioned, we're a startup foundry. That means we actually try to create new companies. And specifically, we're trying to create companies to solve problems that we see in the world. Um, so, for example, we have an app we'll be releasing fairly soon called Uplift, which helps people who are suffering from depression. Uh, we have another app we're working on for people with anxiety. Um, and we have a whole bunch of studies we've been running. For example, a study on habit formation that I'm really excited about. Yeah. All right, we'll get back to Sparkwave uh, later on. But uh, one of the most impressive things you've been doing over the last few years is trying to improve the uh, research methodology in psychology. Tell us a bit about that. So uh, some of our projects at Sparkwave are actually building tools or technology platforms that social scientists and also other people can use to do better social research. Um, so, for example, uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but you can recruit people online for studies very inexpensively. And we've actually built a tool to help people do this um, so that you can quickly answer questions about human psychology. Whereas traditionally, you know, if you had to recruit them to the lab, it might cost 10 or 20 times as much money and time to get those kinds of studies run. Right. So what kinds of questions have you asked people? Uh, so lately, we've been looking at a whole bunch of different things. I mentioned this habit study. Mm. So what we're looking at there is we're trying to figure out which habit formation techniques actually work to get someone to stick to a new habit. So we actually developed 22 micro habit formation interventions. Uh, each of them is just a little thing that you could do that might make you more likely to stick to a habit, like tell a friend that you want to form the habit or put a note card on your computer reminding yourself of the habit. So we have 22 of these, and we're actually randomizing people to different combinations of them to try to figure out what actually works to get people to change their behavior. I guess if you're testing that many different interventions, then you need a pretty large sample, right? Indeed, you do need a large <laughs> sample. Uh, and that's one of the, the wonderful things about these online recruitment methods is that you can get very large samples. And because we don't have to bring people into a lab, because it's all done automatically and digitally, um, it's much cheaper. In fact, our software uh, sets up the entire study. So when someone enrolls, every email they get is already going to be preset and delivered to them at the right time. So the online recruitment process, that's Amazon Mechanical Turk, or are there others? So uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk is is one of the biggest platforms for doing this kind of recruitment. Yeah. Um, we built a tool that actually sits on top of Mechanical Turk. It's sort of an extra layer that makes it better for research purposes. Okay. So we can do... It help, helps us do things really easily, like say, we did one study, we want to exclude those people in our next study because they already have been exposed to this intervention. Or we want to give a second study only on people that have done our first study. So our tool makes that kind of research really easy. 
I imagine the people doing this kind of uh, work online are not typical or they're not representative of, of the whole of society. Do, do you have issues with people having particular age demographics or income or education? Yeah, that's a good question. So the tool I've been mentioning, it's called Task Recruiter. You can check it out, taskrecruiter.com. Um, uh, we've done a lot of research into like, who are these people? What are they like? Um, and in fact, we've added features that also help you target. So you can, in Task Recruiter, you can say, I only want males. I only want people in this age group. So it allows you to use this population, which may not be fully reflective of the group of interest, but kind of craft it to your needs. But another thing about that is that a lot of the work we do tends to target people that are more similar to the Mechanical Turk population than the general U.S. population. So, for example, Mechanical Turk tends to skew younger, like 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, some 50-year-olds, and that tends to be the audience that we're targeting with our apps. Uh, similarly, um, the Mechanical Turk users are more tech-savvy than the typical U.S. population, and again, for us, that's that's more targeted. So the real question is not, is it perfectly representative of the population, but how well does it represent the group that you're interested in studying with your work? So you also created an app called Guided Track, right, which, which we use on the 80,000 Hours site. Uh, t- tell us about that. Yeah, so Guided Track is actually a new language. Uh, it, I like to think of it as the language of behavior change. So the idea is if you're, you want to build an app, let's say you're an expert in sleep and you want to build an app to help people with sleep problems, you're not a programmer, though. Well, how would you do that? Well, you could hire a programmer at great expense, and then you have to figure out how to manage them, to figure out how to recruit a good person. Uh, you also have to have a lot of communication barriers going back and forth about helping them understand what you know. Or you could go use Guided Track, where you could actually learn it pretty easily and build your own app and, and eventually deploy it. Um, and soon you're going to be able to deploy Guided Track programs with iPhone and Android. Um, but right now you can already deploy them to the web. So with a combination of the online recruitment, plus you have this language that you're using that makes it very easy to develop applications, I guess, for encouraging behavior change or surveying people, you're able to run, I guess, vastly more studies than academics can, or you're able to do it much more cheaply? Well, the way I think about it is that in order for research to be useful for the world, a lot of things have to go right. Like, too many things have to go right. First of all, it has to be working on a problem that's actually important. Second of all, you have to have a robust enough method that if you if you answer the question, it's you know, you've gotten the right answer. Uh, third, it has to be novel, so you're not just answering a question someone's already answered. Fourth, someone actually has to take that research that you did and go apply it in the world, etc. You can make a long list of all these things that have to go right. And so, because because our goal, very explicitly, is building products and tools that, that help people accomplish things that they are trying to accomplish or help people with mental health problems and all these different kinds of other applications, we have to think about every one of these things that go wrong and try to make them go right. So it's not just about getting fast research. That's great to get fast research. But, but there's all these other things you have to focus on as well. What kinds of questions have you asked people? Have, have you done anything that's yielded real benefits yet? We well, for example, uh, Uplift, which is our app for people who are, are suffering from depression. Um, we did a big study on that where we measured the depression levels of people who used our app. And um, so, the first eighty people that completed the program, their depression was reduced by fifty percent over about a month. And then we followed up six weeks later, and found out that they basically maintained nearly all of those benefits. And followed up again six months later. This just came out. Actually, we just got these results a few days ago. After six months, they maintained almost all the benefits. So that was an example where that was really important research for us because we needed to see if, if this thing we built to help people with depression was actually doing it, and whether those results would be maintained. That's a huge effect size, almost suspiciously large. It is, it <laughs> Did is. you really believe it? Uh, well, honestly, it's even was even more stronger than I expected. Like. Um, which was super exciting for us. Uh, but the, you know, because our goal is really to help people, we're trying to make it so that our research reflects reality as closely as possible. You know, for us, this is like, if it does, if our program doesn't help people, then we're not achieving our goal. Um, so this kind of research for us is like, are we doing the thing that we're trying to do? And so that means we have to make sure we have to appropriately power the study, have enough, a large enough sample size. We have to think about dropout. We have to think about all these different questions. I guess you were building on existing cognitive behavioral therapy research, so you were trying to pick the, the best ways of treating depression that, that people had already found. That's, that's absolutely right. So what we did is we did a large review of, all, of the evidence that we could find on what really works for depression, and we also studied what existing solutions were out there, and we looked for ways that we strategically thought that we could improve on what had been done before. And part of that is making a program that's highly interactive, that's constantly adjusting to you and reacting to what you say, and it's not just like doing a static online course or reading a book. 
but really trying to make something that's closer to choose your own adventure story, although it's not it's not a game. It's actually t- to help you with depression. And so anyone who's interested in that, you can uh, sign up for our list to, to be one of the first to find out about it at uplift.us. Um, we haven't released yet, but we'll be releasing it fairly soon. Great. Uh, we'll put up, put up a link to that. Are you interested in the, in the broader problems with academic social science? There's been a lot of criticisms, I guess, in the last 10 years and, and really probably going back a long time about the problems of academics running way too many tests on, on their sample so that they can get positive results even if there isn't really a positive result there in the, in the data, uh, like underpowering tests. There's just generally low rates of uh, replicability in, in social science findings. Are you interested in trying to, trying to solve those things uh, more broadly and just tackling the problems one by one? Yeah, so I'm extremely interested in those questions because I believe that social science is actually asking a number of the most important questions that there are. How do you make humans happy? How do you improve human relationships? How do you make humans productive? How do you help mental health? Um, these to me are really fundamental questions in society. Um, and so it's so important that we actually get answers to these questions and we make progress. And I think while academia has has had some wonderful breakthroughs, really some phenomenal ones. Um, I think that it could be doing much better. And the fundamental issue that's the core of everything that you said, that all these different problems, they really all emanate from the same source, which is that the incentive alignment is just not there. If you're an academic, there's an extremely intense pressure to publish in top journals. And if you don't do that, you will get squeezed out of the system. So that means that whatever top journals are willing to publish, that's what you have to do. And that doesn't push you in the direction necessarily of finding the important breakthroughs that are going to be, have huge uh, improvements to people's lives. An interesting uh, finding that I recall reading is that the uh, publications in the top journals actually have lower rates of replication than findings in, uh, in second and third tier journals because they're more exciting, more surprising results, more kind of intuitive results. And so even though they're in better journals, uh, because they're on, on their face implausible findings, in fact, uh, they, they, they don't replicate so much, which suggests that the incentives really are, are not that good if, if you get the best results as an academic is getting a getting a publication in one of the top journals. But in fact, the, the way to do that is to come up with kind of a wacky result that's probably not in fact true well you know it's a very interesting point and one thing that i like to think about is what is the a priori chance that you come up with some novel important idea well that's really hard right you're, you're discovering something new about human psychology and there's millions of people trying and there's lots of people trying so okay but you have to publish a paper so what do you do? And, and not only that, but in each field, there's a certain publication rate that they expect. So reality is really hard. And then there's a certain publication rate you have to hit. So something's got to give there, right? You can't have an amazing, novel, interesting result every time. Now, what's going to give? Well, it could be that what gives is how novel it is. Like maybe it just gets become small tweaks that people are doing on like existing ideas. And that's okay, but it, you know, that's not necessarily good. It might mean that they're making kind of trivial progress. Another thing it could give is quality of the research where you end up finding false positives. And that's more disturbing because then you're actually kind of forcing people to do false positives because if they don't, they can't get the republication rate that they need. That's quite interesting that I think uh, people who aren't super educated maybe don't trust ac- academic journal uh, findings that much. Maybe they, they don't respect uh, the credentials or they don't respect like, academia. And you've got people who are quite informed, who uh, you know are inclined to defer to scientific research. And then there's people who like know a great deal about academic research and, in fact, might be uh, more skeptical than, than many others because they appreciate that just many of these supposed findings uh, wouldn't stand up to scrutiny. Yeah, I think that if you think about, like, let's suppose you, you don't know very much at all about science, you, you might be skeptical of it, as you say, and then you start learning about science, and you're like, studies is the way we should answer questions, but then, you know, one day you realize that studies often contradict each other, and you say, oh, no, what do we do about that? Well, I know, maybe we'll do randomized control trials, because they're, like, better at actually determining causality, and it's very hard to answer causal questions without randomized control trials, so then you get excited about those, but then you start realizing that those contradict each other, so you're like, oh, okay, I know, we need meta-analyses, so then you Start, which group together these randomized control trials. And then you start looking to those and you realize, well, there's publication bias. So, you, so a bunch of randomized control trials were never published. So you actually see a skewed analysis of the data. So then you say, oh, we need meta, we need meta analyses that try to do these corrections for publication bias. And then you start learning that some of the methods for correcting publication bias are actually statistically flawed. 
and like actually are known to not produce the right answers, even though people use them. And you know, you just how far down the wormhole do you want to go? Mm. Um, you know, it can it can get very disturbing, and you're like, wow, okay, I don't. It's hard to know what to trust. Mm. Um, but the but the irony and the sad thing to me is that science is so powerful. I mean, the actual tools we're talking about are incredibly powerful. It's just about how do you execute them in a way in the real world with the weird incentives that exist, so that they actually lead to the right answer. Do you have any ideas for other things that you could do which could make a difference here? Yeah, so as a um, mathematician and machine learning person, one technique that I absolutely love is that when you collect data, you withhold some of it, picked at random from your data set, let's say like 20% of it, put it in a vault, don't look at it, do all the analysis you want. Anything you want, you know, even if you want to do 100 analyses, you know, at first that sounds crazy. Well, you're going to find, you're going to be data mining, you're going to find all these false positives. Fine. But then at the end, when you pick the few that you think are most important and most interesting and check them on the 20% of data you withheld. Now, of course, you're going to have to gather larger sample sizes in order to do this. Uh, and you have to make sure that the amount you withhold is like really enough to confirm however many hypotheses you want to confirm. Like if you want to confirm five at the end, you need to make sure you have enough data to confirm five. But you do that and it keeps you honest because, you know, through, while you're doing your research, you're like, well, I know that I'm going to check this. I know, you know, you're actually scared that you're, it's not going to hold up. Mm. And so it's a great way to enforce discipline on yourself as a researcher. I was taught to do this as an undergraduate, especially in forecasting. I guess in finance, I think this is a, an extremely common thing to do if you're trying to develop trading strategies for stocks. Cause there's no yeah. point, there's no point kidding yourself that this strategy is going <laughs> to make money and then not doing an out of sample test like that. And then, uh, cause you're just going to lose money if, if you're, if you're wrong about the answer. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting how, like in machine learning, this is very standard practice. But in a lot of like psychology, for example, it's like no, a very, very few people do it. Whereas I think that it would be actually be very beneficial. Do you worry that because this method and, and the other things that you're suggesting require larger samples, it's going to distort the kinds of interventions that people test or the kinds of questions that people ask in favor of things that are very cheap to do with a large sample? Just, just doing surveys, for example, rather than providing, you know, substantial services to people? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. I mean, in some sense, I hope that it distorts it in the direction of research that you can do quickly and cheaply. And, you know, I think of the metaphor of, of you've lost your keys under in a dark room. There's a lamp in one corner of the room. The keys are not more likely to be under the lamp than they are to be anywhere else. But you should check under the lamp first because that's the easiest place to find your keys. Yeah. So that's actually the best search strategy. And I I, I, I really like that uh, that story that people use. They make fun of the person who's looking for the keys under the lamppost. But I don't know that they're going to have that much success if they don't look under the lamppost because there's not going to be any any light. So it's kind of you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. If, if the key's not under the lamppost, then you're just in a very tricky situation, whatever you do. Exactly. And that's how I think about research. There's actually so many important questions that one can study that I think that we should do a lot more looking under the lamp. Uh, we should look for areas where we can get a lot of data really quickly that actually helps on a real important problem and say, well, there are these other really important problems that are just really hard to study and, and we'll get around to them. But like the high margin thing, the, you know, the right, you know, the thing that you're going to get a lot of bang for the dollar buck and helping yeah. the world is, is this lamp stuff. Mm. And maybe we just have to leave the, the problems that we can't solve with current methods or current funding for a later time. Yeah, exactly. Another thing that, that I think is really, really important that as, as I've done more and more studies and now I've done really a huge number of studies, I've realized is that research really should be iterative. So you have the standard practice when you do a lot of times when you do science is, you know, you do the big, this big study, you've got to get a paper out of it because otherwise you might have wasted months and like you can't afford or maybe longer than months. You can't afford to just let that data go, you know, go to waste. You've got to get something out of it. And that's a really bad incentive. And then what will happen is people in the open science movement, who are trying to help research be higher quality will say, you know, you really shouldn't do that. You should, you know, pre-register your study and, you know, make it public what you're going to do before you do it. But what I have found doing research is that there's a problem with both of these sides of the coin. If you, if you go and you just do this one big study and force something out of it, of course, you're going to have an incentive to get like some false positive. But if you, you think of a study as like a big monolithic thing where you pre-register all your hypotheses, then you can't learn that much from your study because you're like, well, okay, I didn't, I didn't pre-register this idea. So whereas I think what, what really the best research, in my opinion, is iterative research, because the world's so complex that by the time you do the first study, chances are you're going to learn something that's going to make you realize there's something different about the world than you expected. It might mean you need to do a second study, and that's going to teach you something else, and then a third and a fourth. So this is one reason I'm really excited about rapid online research is we can do five, seven. In one case, we did like 14 studies on one question, because that's how many it took to really feel like we understood it. 
academic social science seems to be in a fairly bad equilibrium, but it's in that equilibrium for a reason. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's a stable situation because the incentives are bad, but it probably also the incentives to change the system are bad. So do you think academics are really likely to take up these, these suggestions and potentially reform the system in ways that might, that might be bad for them because the, the current approach that they're taking uh, would, would no longer get them the publications that they want? That's a great question. That th- that's why I think it's so important that if you're working on asking researchers to do something different, you have to find a way that it's in their immediate interest to do so, not just like the long-term structural interest of all science. Yes. Or it would be good if everyone did it at once, but if you're the one person who goes and does it first, then you're screwed. Exactly. Like If you ask them to do that, you're like, hey, buddy, why don't you just take one for the team? Yeah. And everyone else is not going to do it anyway, so it's going to be for nothing. Right? And you get fired anyway because you don't you don't have the publications because you're aiming for too high quality, so it doesn't, doesn't really even help. They, they have a very good excuse for not doing it. Yeah, I was talking to one high-level research scientist, and she was telling me she associates all this all these recommendations of how to do better science with people who aren't productive. And it's because a bunch of them actually do ask you to spend a whole bunch of extra time. And I think this goes to another important point, which is that resources are strapped already. It's not like researchers are like, I have all this free time and all this free money and all this free you know, researcher labor that I'm not doing anything with. It's, it's such a great idea to just double my sample. I don't know why I didn't think of that. Exactly. Like, um, there's no, there's no resources free sitting around. Mm. So it has to come from somewhere. So one idea that, that we're excited about is creating tools that help people do faster, cheaper research, but also makes it easier for them to make higher quality research. Mm. Um, so just to give one example of that, suppose that you're using an online platform that helping you do research faster, which you want because you're, you know, you want your research to go quickly, but it also made it really easy to release your data to the public because it's already on an online platform. It's just a, a checkbox. Maybe it's not even a checkbox. Maybe it's already defaulted to saying it will release this in one year, you know, and then you have to say, no, actually I don't want it. And then the system tells you you're an asshole, <laughs> uh, but it lets you still not release if you don't want to, you know, so the idea is that you can give people these, you can make it easy to do the good thing. So it's very little extra time on their part. You can nudge them to try to do the good thing and you can help them do what they're trying to achieve during that process so that they actually want to use your tool. Let's go back to the to the mental health app. So I'm sometimes pretty depressed myself. What, what would the app offer me? So we try to very closely follow the protocol of cognitive behavioral therapy. So our app, you do one to two sessions a week, and they usually take about 30 to 40 minutes. And this is this is intensive stuff. You're going to get homework assignments, and it's going to check in on you, see how you're doing. It's going to have all kinds of tools to help you solve problems. To help, Let's say, for example, you didn't do your homework. It's going to help you try to figure out why you didn't do your homework. It's going to help you develop a strategy to do it next time. Yeah. So it's going to be really, really intensive. Um, but basically, the idea is teach you the principles of CBT and get you using them in your daily life. Because just knowing the principles without using them, really not valuable. Do you only include people who actually go ahead and use the CBT properly in your sample to test whether it's effective? Or do you include everyone who kind of signed up for it, but then didn't really follow through because I guess it didn't help them? Well, you can do, I mean, there's something called intention to treat analysis where, where anyone who enrolls in a study, even if they disappear, let's say they drop out after one hour in the study, you still count them as though they're in the study. If you do an intention to treat analysis, there's two ways, or there's more than two, but there are two major ways you can do the analysis. You can say, well, for everyone that dropped out of the study, let's tr- let's treat them as their last measurement. And, and like that's what we, it's called last measurement carried forward. Or you can treat them as a total failure. You say if they dropped out, we treat them as though they had no benefit. Worst case. Yeah. Um, I guess the worst case is that they something really bad happens to them. But yeah, but the reason but for something that's you know generally helpful, worst case is nothing happened. And then you can do non-intention to treat analysis, which is just say, look at the people who just completed the program, for example. And so we've done all of those kinds of analyses, of course. Because when you're trying to figure out the way reality works, mm. you do every analysis to make sure you understand all the different aspects and then integrate it but just be careful not to pick the the most outlier result the one that seems most positive see that's the really interesting thing when you're making recommendations for what people should do to be trustworthy to outsiders like what research practices you should have so that I can see that what you're doing is good. They end up being quite different than the research practices that you do to see for yourself to see that what you're doing is good. So, for example, it's very common that people will say, well, you shouldn't test too many hypotheses. You shouldn't collect too many variables. 
Well, that's because from the outside perspective, if I know you collected a ton of variables and just reported on a few of them, I can't tell why you did that. Maybe those are, you tried like a hundred different analyses and you just gave me the three that had any kind of significance. But if, if you're doing the research yourself for yourself and your motivation is really to figure out the truth about the world, you actually do want to collect a lot of variables, but you want to hold yourself to a really high standard by doing things like withholding data in a vault so that at the end you can check to make sure you didn't come into false conclusions. Mm. But the reason you want a lot of variables is because it gives you a lot of flexibility to ask questions you hadn't even thought of, to check things in different ways, to look at if there's three things are pointing in the same direction, that's a good sign. I guess, of course, it's, it's not so bad if you're doing it yourself because you know everything that you did and in principle you can correct for that and think, well, I, I ran a lot of tests so it's not surprising that some of them came back positive but it might be difficult to know exactly what kind of correction to make in, in your own mind. But I guess you're saying the, the out-of-sample testing basically allows you to do that in a pretty thorough way? Exactly, yeah, because for example, it, I mean, let's say the things at the end of the day were just simple averages and you're like, okay, at the end of the day I'm going to collect 100 variables but let's say I think that I'm going to have like probably five averages that will be the important findings. Well, you can withhold enough data on the side that you can, with pretty high confidence, check those five averages without succumbing to many false positives. So, Do you think that these uh, mental health apps is going to turn out to be one of the most effective ways of dealing with mental health problems, or maybe just improving health around the world in general? Well, this is really, I mean, this is our goal. Of course, there's always a lot of uncertainty in these kinds of things, but we're trying to create completely scalable solutions. And so, actually, uh, earlier you talked about this question of like, well, does trying to do like this fast online type research lead to doing kind of trivial or like things that aren't like deeply helpful. And see, I think one of the neat things about it is it forces you to do scalable things, right? Because if you're doing it online, if you're never meeting with that person in person, it has to be scalable. Mm. And guided track, our behavior change language, when you build a study, you can then take the same code and turn it into an app. So, you know, if you found an intervention worked in a study, why not release it to the world and let everyone benefit from that? So our thinking is let's try to be completely scalable solutions. Because they're software, we could offer them at very low cost. We can Anyone can use them. And you can help people in the developing world as well as just rich people in America. Exactly. Long term, you know, we're going to start it in the U.S., but long term, we would love to bring this to India, for example, um, and other countries. All right. Well, let's let's move on. Uh, you also started this website, clearerthinking.org. Uh, tell us about what people could find on that. So clearerthinking.org is a website for helping you understand how to make better decisions and, in general, how to improve your life through using the ideas from science. So the thing that you'll observe is that there are all of these books about findings, so say, from behavioral economics or about the way human mind goes wrong and can be irrational. But there's very little content about how you take that information and actually live a better life with it. So our mission with clear thinking is actually turning these things into interactive tools, interacting tests, interacting training programs that let you apply these insights to what you're doing. Um, so an interesting example of this is Bayesian thinking. So this is, sounds like a, you know, confusing math concept, but we have a, a little training program on Bayesian thinking where it teaches it to you in a completely non-mathematical way. We don't need equations to teach it to you. And then we actually give you a whole bunch of examples of like from your life, from the kinds of things you deal with in your life, and how it should change your thinking about those things. What is Bayesianism? Ah, so can you explain it in thirty seconds, or is that a bit challenging? Uh, so basically, so there, a lot, people mean a lot of different things when they say Bayesianism. Um, here, I just am referring to Bayes' rule, which is this rule that says, let's suppose you want to know the probability of something. Well, before you got some evidence you had some probability. You thought there was a 10% chance of that thing happening. Now you have some new evidence. Well, how confident should you, should you be? Now should you be 20% or 5%? Yeah. So it's basically just a mathematical rule about how to take your prior probability and then update it when you learn something new. Which part of the site has been most successful? So our most popular program we ever made is our uh, How Rational Are You test. Uh, I took was, that. Oh, you took that? I, uh, I got pretty good results. and I don't want to brag, <laughs> but... Uh, um, we, you know, it's actually really funny because uh, there was someone I showed it to right before we launched, just a, someone I'm friends with, and they were like, "Who would ever want to use this? Like, who's the target market? Who's the target demographic? I don't understand." People who want to show off, I think, because <laughs> you made it easy to share on Facebook. I recall, so I saw it, a lot of people pro pro posting their their positive results. I didn't so many, see so many people posting their bad results, but I guess. Well, you know, so what we try to do in the program is we try to. So each question is linked to a known bias, and then the 
as you go through it, we're, we analyze your biases and we give you at the end a report and we tell you about your strengths and weaknesses. And most people have both strengths and weaknesses when it comes to bias. And then we actually link you to content that we made to help with each of those. So it's not just, okay, you know, you have this bias, good luck. It's like, oh, and if you want to work on it, why don't you go to this other content of ours? Mm. Um, and yes, yeah, so we've had a really good response from that. The site is what, three years old? Yeah, maybe slightly older. Um, how many readers do you have now? What kind of traffic do you get? Um, so our mailing list is about um, twenty thousand people, and um, we tend to it, we tend to get big influxes when we release new programs. So mm-hmm. we'll try to get you know, media to write about our work, which we've been quite successful with. And um, so right, we in the pipeline, we actually have a few new programs that we're gearing up to launch. So I'm really excited about. So there's a crazy number of articles and, and tools on the site. How did you produce so much of it so quickly? Well, you know, it's funny. So <laughs> we don't have a big team for it. it clear things is a small team. But uh, we leverage Guide to Track, our behavior change programming language, which means that, so, um, for example, our writer is, in a sense, a programmer because he's writing interactive content. He's not a programmer by profession. He's a writer by profession. So it allows us to sort of leverage the power of, of writing as, but actually release these interactive tools. Um, and so I think it just, it accelerates our, our development process so much. Can, can listeners potentially use guided track as well? Is it, is it just available for anyone? Uh, so guided track, if you go to guidedtrack.com, you can, you can check it out. But, um, right now it lets you sign up for the mailing list and we'll, you know, as soon as it's released to the public, we'll, we'll let you know and you can try it out. But yeah, 80, as you know, 80,000 hours uses it. And yeah, we found it uh, incredibly helpful. We've, uh, I'll put up a link to some of the uh, guided track, uh, tools that we have on our site as well. So I imagine given your philosophy, you'll be super keen to test whether these uh, apps are really working. Uh, do you have much evidence that they've actually managed to help people reduce their biases? Because I know there's been a bunch of research suggesting that simply being aware of your biases uh, doesn't help, but you're trying, trying to go beyond that, I guess. You know, it's really interesting. So it depends on the bias and, and the situation. So let's take the sunk cost fallacy, which is the idea that a lot of times when people put a lot of energy or time or resources into a project and they're evaluating whether they should quit, they they don't want to quit even though rationally they should because if they quit they have to then suddenly recast all that effort and money and resources as a waste and they, that's really psychologically painful so this is one reason the sunk cost fallacy occurs is they, they stick with it so that they, they can continue deferring actually having to admit that that was all wasted all that past effort of course when you're making a decision you should only be thinking about the future like, is this worthwhile given all the stuff that's going to happen in the future? The past stuff is already spent. I'm not going to get that back. So how would you help someone with the sunk cost fallacy? Well, there's actually a really simple solution. If you can teach someone a pattern of what the sunk cost fallacy looks like, and you can get enough triggers in place so that when they're in, in their real life, when they're falling for it, they think to themselves, hey, this is like the sunk cost fallacy. And then you actually give them enough motivation to realize that, like, hey, you know what? I'm just delaying the inevitable. Like, by continuing this on, I actually make things worse. They're about to lose even more again. Yeah. Exactly. That may be enough. So whereas other biases, like the halo effect, where if you think someone is good in one way, it makes you think that they're good in another way, that may be a lot harder to correct. Um, because, for example, just having the thought, oh, I like this person this one way, am I having a halo effect for the other, uh, the, you know, these other traits they have? You may be completely unaware of whether you are or aren't. And you may be very incapable of actually doing the proper correction. So I think that different biases are, are more or less tractable in how fixable they are. Um, in terms of efficacy, we've been getting more and more into running studies on our work. Um, you know, when you're first starting and you're just getting your friend in the door, you're just trying to make content that people find valuable. But, but now we're getting more into it. Like, for example, this habit formation study, we're actually looking at which these habit techniques work. Um, we're doing a study, on, we're building a study for sleep problems. Because if you think about what do people suffer from in our society, it's like mental health problems, sleep problems, relationship problems, things like this. Yeah. So we're working on a program for sleep problems, and we're actually going to be running a trial where we enroll people to try our tool, and we track them, and we see if they actually have improvements in their sleep quality. Hmm. Do you think in some cases these biases might actually not be biases once you consider all of the benefits and costs that people face? For example, with the sunk cost fallacy, if you're running a project in a company and you're considering closing it down, uh, you might just want to delay the, the company realizing that your project is a failure because once they realize that, then uh, you might be fired. And so you just want to hold on as, as long as possible. And presumably there's there's some f- like social phenomena like this that explain uh, why people are programmed to behave in these seemingly 
biased ways, at least some of the time. It could actually be reasonable. Well, it's interesting. You can try to break the biases down in different categories, and it can be hard to tell which biases fall in which category. But if you think about evolutionary history, the reason our minds are constructed the way they are is because it was really helpful for survival, right? They evolved to help us survive. Now, there were some of these biases that actually weren't biases at all in our evolutionary environment. They were just useful. Now, um, maybe they didn't give you the right answer all the time, but they were they saved computational power. They allowed you to make decisions faster. So kind of not that they were perfect, but they were very effective. There are other types of biases that were just not really triggered in that environment. In other words, like you just wouldn't have been in that weird situation. Like you think of um, sugar as an example. Like it's very important that we find sweet things tasty because in our kind of evolutionary history, like getting calories was super important. Today, sugar, you know, the fact that we find sugar so tasty is really a problem and, and you know, it can cause all kinds of health issues. So, um, you know, a lot of people have gone and tried to reinterpret the bias literature and say, oh, these things are actually not biases. Like if I come up, I can come up with some complicated way where this is actually rational. And I think that in some cases they're right. But the, but the reality is, I mean, our brains are just they're heuristics based. Our, our, our minds are constantly running heuristics about what to do. And heuristics, while they work in some settings, they fail in others. And that's the key is knowing the settings in which they fail. Uh, the fact that they work in some, great. Well, that, you're going to do that anyway. That's what the way your brain works. You just need to know the cases they won't work. If someone wants to go uh, try out clearerthinking.org, obviously they've got this rationality test, which is kind of fun. Uh, what, what other tool uh, should, should they start with? Uh, so another one, one that I, I really uh, like is our common misconceptions test. And so the idea is we give you 30 things, half of which are common misconceptions and half of which are actually true, but sound like they might be common misconceptions. And you have to predict which is which. But where it gets fun is that we actually have you bet points on how, based on how confident. So if you we say like if you're really confident you bet 10 points if you're only somewhat confident you know you bet 6 points and so on and then at the end we actually can use that to analyze the way that you made predictions to see whether you were overconfident or underconfident we could also tell we actually also can tell you how accurate you were and we can correct these common misconceptions that you may have about the world and so it kind of does a lot of fun things at once that yeah, I've used that one. It's uh, it's really cool. I, I was I was sweating it because of course you you want to get good results at the end. You want to seem like you're calibrated. I was uh, I was spending a lot of time thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, were you able to see whether uh, people as a whole were were calibrated on average? Um, you know, I can't remember. I think people are a little bit overconfident on average. A bit overconfident. Yeah, if I recall yeah. correctly. That that doesn't surprise me too much. Let's move on again. You've written about how people can best succeed as entrepreneurs or tell if they're a good fit for entrepreneurship. Uh, tell us about what criteria they should be looking at. Yeah, so this is a subject very important to me because at Sparkway, we actually recruit CEOs to take our products, continue developing them, and spin them out. So we actually, like for example, right now we have three CEOs that we've recruited. They're going to be spinning out products of ours. So, um, so there are a lot of traits that one can think about for entrepreneurship. But I'd say that one of the very most important ones is persistence in the face of great challenges. It's really interesting if you talk to successful entrepreneurs, because a lot of times they'll tell you that their company almost failed. Sometimes once, sometimes multiple times. I was talking to an entrepreneur the other day. He said three different times they were not going to be able to make payroll. Like it was Friday and they didn't have enough money in the bank to pay their employees on Monday. And they managed to get through all three. And now it's a successful company. Now, most people are just not psychologically able to deal with this kind of situation. And what's going to happen is when these huge momentous problems occur and it looks like failure is imminent, they're not going to continue driving. They're not going to actually accelerate the driving forward to solve the problem and they're going to give up. And giving up means that their employees are going to read the signals that they're giving up. Uh, it means investors are going to lose confidence in them and, and they're very likely to fail. So the, the irony is that um, the sort of person who tends to succeed is one that is just unwilling to give up even when it looks, even when the evidence says that things are not going to go well. Hmm. Did you find any more counterintuitive ideas for, for what predicts uh, being a successful startup founder? I guess that's too obvious for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one thing that I find quite interesting, I don't know if this is counterintuitive enough for you, is this sort of tension between um, persistence and looking at the evidence. So it's really important that the person is driving relentlessly towards a general goal, but at the same time, they're highly flexible about how they get to that goal. And, you know, a number of people have written about this idea, um, but I think it's, it's really important to highlight that 
basically, if you're not flexible, so I, you, you see entrepreneurs who fail in both of these ways. You see the ones who give up, but you also see ones that are like persistent, not just about the end goal, but persistent about how they get there. And so they'll keep trying the same thing over and over again, hitting a brick wall. And so actually this other trait, which is coming up with clever, unexpected solutions, most of them will fail to solve these problems, but then they'll come up with another and another and another. And so being extremely flexible about how you get there. Hmm. Do you want people who are generalists or, or, or people who are good in, in kind of good in a lot of ways or are like very good in, in just one or two ways? So for us, the, the people we recruit, um, so we kind of act like the CTO. We build the first version of the product and we only recruit them when we, when our product is getting to the point where we think it like has a lot of potential. And so they don't need to come with technical skills. And so that's something that's unusual. A lot of, you know, if you're building a software startup, it can be generally really helpful to be a technical person, but we kind of handle most of that for them. So that means that we can focus on people who are more, more into the business side and the marketing side. Um, so those are the, you know, that's the kind of skill area that we're, we're going for. Is your talk about this on online or the article? Uh, I'm not sure which one. About predicting entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial success. Ah, uh, uh, there's, okay. So on clear thinking, yeah. on clearthinking.org, you can check out, we have actually have a test that we developed. So we went through the works of people who had started, let's say three successful companies or founded two successful companies and then funded 150 successful companies or oh, sorry, 150 companies. And we took all the things they said that we could find and we turned them into a test. And so what you can do is you can actually go through this test. And then it will kind of analyze your responses and give you a report about ways that you are and are not suited to be a startup founder. And suggest some ways to improve, I suppose. Exactly. And suggest ways that you could be better. Speaking of entrepreneurship, uh, you've written quite a lot about how startups might unintentionally make make the world worse. Uh, how can you tell if you're doing harm as a startup founder or tech entrepreneur? That's a great question. So I think a lot of times people will make this argument that if people are buying your products, you must be adding value. You know, why else would they buy it if it wasn't valuable to them? And, and it first, a libertarian argument, a free market argument. Yeah, it's a free market argument. And um, at first glance, it sounds very compelling. And I've heard this many people make this argument. But if you really think about it for a minute, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. So I think of there being four categories of ways that companies can cause harm. Um, the first is when there's imperfect information. So imagine there's a supplement company that makes supplements that just don't do the thing that they claim to do. Now, why would they continue to exist? Why would people buy the product? Well, because a lot of times the thing that supplements claim to do are not easily measurable. You can't tell if it's doing them. So heart health would be a great example. How do you know if your heart is actually healthier? I think in economics, these are called post-experience goods. Uh, ah. You have experience goods where you need to use them to tell whether it's working. And then you have post-experience goods where even after you've used them, you can't tell whether oh, they've worked. Fine. And uh, post-experience goods are some of the products where you find the most dodgy markets, basically, where there's lots of fraudulent products because just there's no there's no feedback cycle. You can use the supplement. You don't even know whether it had the thing in it that it, that it claimed to have. Exactly. And another example of that would be a product that you would only use once. So they don't need repeat business at all. So they don't really care about you having a good experience. This is the, the restaurant in a tourist area in a city where they, they're happy to screw you over because you're leaving the next day and you're not coming back. Exactly. Um, so that would be the first first category. The second is where companies exploit irrationality. So an example of this would be that, like, let's say a company puts out, you know, some kind of lottery. Now, some people might just find it fun to buy a lottery ticket, or they might they might say, oh, well, it's worth, you know, like it helps me fantasize about winning money, which is a fun experience, all these kinds of things. Those are fine. But some people, they actually just overestimate the chance that they're going to win. And because of that, this is actually kind of an irrationality that we humans suffer, that we're bad at dealing with small probabilities, and those that can be exploited. So to go to the third, third category, um, I think about products that involve zero-sum games or even negative-sum games. So an example of this, imagine a company that makes software that helps you spam people. Like that software right, might actually be benefiting the person who's buying it, but it might actually be hard, like directly taking that value from other people whose time is being wasted. Or another example would be if a company that makes software that helps in some marketplace, it helps one side of the marketplace do better relative to the other side of the marketplace. Does uh, Facebook notifications and the kind of addiction you get with social media fall into this category? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I would probably put that in some combination. Uh, I'd probably put that into exploiting irrationality, like addictive products where we consume them more than we say we want to. Like if you ask the person right before they use it, they say, I would only want to use this for 10 minutes. And then 
they actually start and then they use it for 40 minutes and then you ask them after and they say, God, I'm not happy that I used it for 40 minutes. Yeah. That kind of product is kind of, uh, I think, exploiting irrationality. So this is more the class of uh, products that maybe benefit the user but harm some third party. Well, it's, it's a redistribution between yeah. the user and some other group, basically. Okay. Uh, and then the fourth example, which actually is, is related to that one, is uh, negative externality. So um, there, oftentimes, the company is not intending to... to move value from like to this party at the expense of another party, but they might be doing it. And the classic example is you've got a factory and they, they make useful products, but then they dump their like toxic sludge into the river, which poisons the the local people, right? It's a really extreme example. Hmm. Uh, And you think that more companies are doing this than maybe other people believe? Um, I think that a lot of people, well, they, well, it's interesting. You know, there's a certain, there's certain people out there who think like companies are, are evil and they're like, they're bad actors. And there are other people who are out there and they say, no, 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 if, if people are buying the product, then it must be doing good. And I think both of those views are kind of problematic and, and not realistic. Um, personally, the way I like to think about companies is there are these machines that are designed for a specific goal, which is, you know, approximately what the goal is, is something like maximize profit to the owners. Of course, that's not a perfect model, but it's like a reasonable, fairly accurate model of what they're doing. Now, we shouldn't be too surprised if these machines go out and cause harm when it's profitable to do harm. We also shouldn't be surprised if they do good when it's profitable to do good. And so it's, it's, it's really like, I think the right way to think about them is there are these machines that do a certain thing and sometimes that thing causes harm, sometimes it does good. And one way to think about regulation is that, um, regulation can try to make it so that there are fewer of these ways that companies can cause harm uh, while making money because by by making it illegal for example to harm people while making money then the companies are going to be pushed more towards doing the good ways to make make money so hmm. uh, which tech companies do you think might be bad for the world do you have any examples of ones that most people think are good but you think are bad i'm gonna take a pass on that question uh, <laughs> i don't, I don't, don't like, want to make any I don't enemies. Want to name names yeah <laughs> okay but, but i i would i would uh suggest that people really Think about some of the products they use and say, well, is this actually causing improvement in the world? And, um, uh, there is some really interesting research that was done where they, they showed people how much time they spent, um, using different apps yeah. at the end of the week. I think this was from Time Well Spent. Time well spent. You can Google it. Yeah. I'm hoping to interview the, the creator of that. It's a Tristan. very interesting project. Yeah. Tristan. Yeah. Um, and they actually, uh, analyzed, did people say they were happy with the time they spent or unhappy? And it's really interesting to look at what apps people were really happy with and which ones they were actually like unhappy with their usage of the time. Yeah. Speaking of which, so startups, they absorb capital investment and they absorb staff that they need yeah. and they absorb the time and attention of users. And you have to think about what would have happened otherwise. So what right. if you create a startup that in a sense, is useful. It's creating a product that has non-zero value. But someone else would have taken that time and that attention and those staff members and that capital and made something that was even more useful. So uh, the opportunity cost is, is is quite substantial. Is that another way that companies can can do harm just by existing? Well, so that's a really interesting one. So the thing is, you know, mother, money is generally not created or destroyed. I mean, obviously, except when, you know, governments print it and things like that. But, um, you know, money is just is moved around between actors, you know, like bill, a bill passed from hand to hand to hand. But time can be destroyed. So let's say a company hires thousands of people and has them doing, you know, making some not very important thing. that's not that beneficial. Let's say it actually benefits people, but it's a but that product's below average, not a benefit for the amount of labor going into it. Well, the time of those people is gone forever, right? They could have spent that time doing something more beneficial to society. So yes, that is absolutely a way that companies can cause harm. So money isn't destroyed, but but capital can can be wasted. So you imagine if you start a company and you go out and try to solicit funding, there's a bit of randomness in that process. And if your company is above below average usefulness for the world, and then someone invests in you just because you happen to get lucky, you, you did a good presentation, you met the right person, you're, and then you use that money to build a factory, you might be pulling away you know investment from another company that otherwise would have gotten that investment or had those resources and would have built a more useful product. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so for so it could block another company from getting that money at that time. All right, let's push on. You're involved in the effective altruism community, and I'm curious to know what you think about how effective uh, effective altruism as a whole is developing. Uh, what kinds of things do do you like about it first? So you know, I was really excited to learn about the effective altruism community a number of years ago because um, my life's mission for a very long time has been to try to see how I can 
help society in really large ways. And so it was really exciting to me to discover, hey, there are other people who are, who are, this is their mission as well. And so I think that's been, that has been really cool to me. Um, in terms of how I think the, the effective altruism movement is doing, um, one thing that I am really interested in is people trying more new things. Like basically, um, I think that in effective altruism, there tends to be three cause areas that a lot of people gravitate to or towards, uh, you know, one being existential threats, like threats to, you know, wiping out humanity or you know, these like low, potentially low probability, but really, really high bad outcome events. Uh, second being, um, global health, like how do we, how do we give money, um, so that we can help the poorest people in the world or help people who are really sick, uh, really cost effectively. And then third being, can we help animals? Can we, can we make their lives better? Um, and I think those are, those are all really interesting cause areas. And I think that there's, there's, um, interesting arguments around each of them, but I also think it's important to explore lots of different kinds of ways to help people and make sure that there's like a broad portfolio, um, because there might be even better opportunities or there might be just you know, other ways that there's on the margin, we can get, you know, a lot of bang for the buck. You're saying you think we're a bit too narrowly focused, perhaps on just a few problems when we could have a broader view? I think potentially, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm suggesting that might be the case. Might be the case. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, what kind of problems would you like to see us work on? Perhaps mental health is one? Well, yeah, of course, you know, there's my own bias, which is that, like, I think mental health is an incredibly important topic. Um, I think it causes absolutely massive amounts of suffering. Now, you know, how do you balance that against, you know, let's say a small probability of the world being destroyed? Mm. You know, that's a really tough question. But I think it is, but I think it's a really important topic. And, you know, even, you know, whether it's the most important, that I'm not going to necessarily, you know, have a, a stake in that one. But yeah. Are there any common mistakes you think people in the effective altruism community are making when they're planning planning out their careers? Um, I think I just don't know well enough to to be confident in that. Um, but I think I you know I'd love to see people in effective altruism working on direct science. I think that could be potentially really a powerful kind of um, work to do, especially because they might come into it with a different mindset than you know, the publisher parish mindset, and they might be able to find ways to do research that's kind of being neglected. That's really, really valuable um, because of the focus on really trying to help the world. We're trying to shift the emphasis a little bit on our site, uh, encouraging more people to specialize in particularly useful areas of scientific research. So I think, oh, I think we agree on that. Well, we found perhaps a lot of our readers uh, early on in their career are going into very generalist roles where they're just trying to skill up and not specialize. And uh, for the community as a whole, that's creating some problems that we have now a lot of generalists and, and not many people who are real experts in, you know, uh, nanotechnology or, you know, right. biomedical research. And so right. we just don't know, have people who have the sufficient expertise to say whether we should be putting more effort into those or not. So it's one of those cases where it, maybe it's beneficial for uh, that, for each individual to, to be a generalist because then they're keeping all of their options open. But then as a community, you end up in a, it's a tricky situation where you've got a whole bunch of generalists who, and no one has a specialized knowledge that they can instruct everyone else on what they need to know about their, their area of expertise. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, as one potential example of that, I think um, the threat of biologically engineered viruses and bacteria is, is really frightening. And and um, as technology develops, it seems likely that the probability of these kinds of, of potentially hugely catastrophic events occurring will go up. But I think the, the effective altruism community is not as well positioned as it could be to work on that kind of problem because of a lack, potential lack of expertise in biology and other related areas. So I think that could be really interesting for more people to work on that kind of you know, specialty. It's a great example. We, we have a few people who know a bit about that. But yeah, we can have a lot more depth of expertise and then we'll be able to, to get a lot more done. Speaking of catastrophic risks, do you share the worries that some other people have about very powerful artificial technology? We spoke with Dario uh, Amade uh, a, oh, okay. a couple of weeks ago. He, he explained his perspective on this. So w w what do you think about it? Well, so I think that there's generally three risks people worry about. And I can, I'll say them in order of increasing weirdness. Uh, so the first risk is that automation will cause mass unemployment. And, um, you know, people on one side say, well, we don't really need to worry about this because, you know, overall, if you look at society, it seems like automation actually has been really good for society in a lot of ways. And, you know, even when there's been huge amounts of automation that have occurred over the last hundred years, it hasn't led to like massive unemployment, you know, at least not most of the time. And so maybe automation is good and maybe it was all overblown. But then I think on the flip side, you can make the argument, well, okay, but let's look at the micro level, like look at the individual person. You know, let's say a self-driving car automates away truck driving. What is it happens to that truck driver? Well, 
they have some options. They could go retire early. They could, you know, if they're close to retirement already, they could go retrain for a skilled job. They could go work in an unskilled job. Um, they, but those actions might also depress, like push down prices in those other areas. So it seems at like a micro level, if automation were to go too quickly, like lots of people could end up without jobs really rapidly. And then it's unclear how the market would absorb them. And maybe it would absorb them eventually, but you might get a situation where prices get very depressed in certain re- areas, you know, where wages get really nailed. Um, and it, they could cause really big problems. And then, you know, on, on top of this, some people worry that like if this were to happen too fast or too much of it, it could cause societal unrest and like destabilize society. I think at 80,000 Hours, we have a slightly un- unusual view on this. This has been a topic that's been in the media uh, a lot uh, recently, and people are saying that perhaps unemployment problems today are caused by uh, increasing automation. But having looked at what economists think and, and, and looking at the numbers, the, the, the evidence for uh, unemployment today being caused by mass automation is just really uh, quite poor. And, and I'll put up some links to, to some papers explaining why, why that's the case. But on the flip side, we think there's strong reasons to think that in the long term, eventually we will get to a point where machines can do uh, maybe all of the tasks that humans can do better and more cheaply than we can. And there's just only so many capabilities that, that humans have. And in the past, uh, we've started using machines to do like one of the things that humans can do which is like heavy lifting um but uh but fortunately there was lots of other um tasks that humans were still much better at than than machines so people just started to to move up the the list of tasks and in in order of sophistication but eventually machines will just cross off all of these and there just won't be uh, anything that that humans uh have a have a uh, have an advantage at and then and so that gives us a strong reason in principle to think that eventually humans should be displaced by machines uh, in the workplace maybe maybe not soon but uh, one day yeah and i i share the concern that like this this is increasingly an issue i, I don't have an opinion on to what extent it's caused the current unemployment but but you you know and i think with especially with artificial intelligence you could see a path where it just rapidly replaces a whole huge swath of human labor mm. all right so what's what's the next risk so the next risk is that artificial intelligence allows one group to gain too much power and there's a, there's different ways this could happen one way this could happen is maybe a one company ends up kind of having an ai monopoly like their ai is just so much better than the other companies or their AI is really good plus their branding is so strong that they end up basically absorbing a huge amount of the labor done in society you know so okay there's the unemployment thing we talked about but like now imagine there's this company that's making the money that all those people used to be making this and company you, is now representing 10 percent of gdp or one day 90 percent of gdp if it takes over most most jobs exactly and that that kind of possibility is potentially frightening because just the concentration of power like that means that 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 company could just have enormous sway in society and what if it doesn't have the values that we care about and, and that kind of thing are there any movies, sci-fi movies, where where this is the plot line? I guess oh, I guess you have question. that a little bit with with Blade Runner uh, to some extent. Or I guess yeah, it's not as popular in science fiction. Not as much. Not as exciting. <laughs> they're not as interested in economic change or economic restructuring as uh, perhaps uh, aliens attacking Earth. But <laughs> exactly. Um, but then there's another version of that, like concentrating power, which is that it's not so much that the AI enables one group to like replace people's jobs and, and, and add all, you know, um, basically make money that way. But instead that it's sort of think about it. Imagine that you had like some magical Oracle advisor that could allow you to predict things much better than everyone else could predict. Well, you could see all kinds of ways that that could give you control over society or let you pull the strings. You could predict like, well, if we did this change, what would happen? Oh, it would cause this effect or it would allow you to develop strategies that nobody else could see. Now, you know, if you just think of sort of like human level ability to strategize, it doesn't, you know, you're like, okay, you have a great strategist, you know, maybe that gives you some advantage. But if you imagine that this achieved like superhuman levels, maybe the people that control that AI could actually really influence society in a way that it's sort of unprecedented. Or potentially they could have extraordinary military power, just ability to do violence. Is that, is that another possibility? Potentially. I mean, if, they, um, you know, if they were, for example, imagine one day there's a sup- there's an AI that's better than humans at certain kinds of science. Um, if one group developed that AI before others, they might be able to make scientific breakthroughs that are, like, are leagues ahead of everyone else that might give military capabilities, for example. You know, like um, the ability to build the atom bomb was a, was a kind of scientific breakthrough, right? Um, so, so, yeah, there's, there's a, so I would say there's a whole cluster of these ways that sort of artificial intelligence could potentially, you know, it's hard to say what, with what probability, lead to very extreme concentrations of power. 
Okay, uh, so that's a little bit weird, but it's uh, not probably the strangest thing that people have heard. What's what's the third one? Okay, so the third one, and many, to many people the weirdest, is but but very popular in science fiction, is that uh, humanity builds an artificial intelligence that's that's much much smarter than us, at, le- at least in some capacities that are very important, and that we as humans lose control of it. Um, so either that means that it does what we intended it to do, but turns out, sorry, that it does what we programmed it to do, but what we programmed it to do is not actually what we want it to do um, or uh, it could mean that the AI like changes itself in some way or ends up being different than than you know so maybe initially it's what we thought but it ends up due to various forces like let's say it's a, it's a self-improving AI it modifies itself um, now of course a lot of people um, think these ideas are you know kind of sound science fiction they believe they're you know wacky and you know they are they are science fiction and they do sound wacky but on the other hand even if there's some small probability that's happening, I think we should take it very seriously because, you know, people talk about the idea that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. You know, this is a common phrase. But when you're talking about a potential societal risk that could have massive negative consequences for someone, I think a more appropriate phrase is that when you have the possibility of extraordinary harm, you actually need extraordinary evidence to dismiss it. Because even a 3% chance that some really atrocious, you know, worldwide thing could happen is worth taking very, very seriously. You'd have to get that 3% down to a much, much, much lower probability before you could say, we shouldn't worry about that. Mm. Yeah, I think 3% is kind of a, a reasonable number. And it's, and it's somewhat scarily, scarily too high, uh, which is one of the reasons why we've, we're, we're having a number of conversations about this and trying to get people working on the problem. So at least they, there's sufficient attention that we can try to, try to bring that, bring that number down and feel a little bit more, more comfortable and then move on to other risks and uh, other, other potential um, improvements that we could make for the world. Absolutely. And, you know, one, one metaphor I like to think of with, you know, if, if you think about, well, you know, okay, let's say you, someone were to one day build a, an AI that was much, much smarter than humans. It seems like this should be fit, like, it, this doesn't seem to violate the laws of physics as far as we understand the laws of physics so it may be possible well why is it so important exactly how this ai is programmed well i have a metaphor for this which is imagine you're driving a car at 40 miles an hour right it matters what way you're aiming but it but you can correct right you know you're going a little too far to the right you're going into the right lane you can kind of go to the left right the problem is let's say you're driving a car at 40 million miles per hour right even the slightest error could you know you've blow up part of the world or something like this, right? Like the momentum you have. So the idea is that if you build like something that's a little bit smart, like, okay, not that big a deal. If it's like slightly misprogrammed, you can correct it. If you build something that's massively smart, that's at least in, in some very important capacities, much, much smarter than humans, then a slight error in the programming uh, or misunderstanding of how that programming is going to manifest could lead to massive worldwide changes that you didn't expect. We don't have time to go into all the technical technical explanations for why a really advanced artificial intelligence might be dangerous, but I'll stick up a link to our explanation and, and some other, other papers about this. You ran a study about perceptions of catastrophic risks, is that right? That is correct, yeah. You're bringing up the, bringing up the graph there. Uh, what, did, what did you find? Um, so one thing that we found that was really interesting is that uh, we asked people to estimate the probability of different catastrophic events happening. And we found that when we asked people, what do you think the probability is that in the next 50 years, uh, humans will go completely extinct? People put this at an incredibly small probability. Like they thought it was essentially impossible. And to me, I was very interested in that because while I don't think it's very likely, uh, um, I, I certainly wouldn't say it's close to impossible. But we found when we surveyed people that, that you know, vast majority of people thought it was absurdly unlikely. And this worries me because I think that, um, you know, even if these events are unlikely, they're so potentially so catastrophic that we need to take them seriously. And, you know, so the, the class example of this is asteroids. Like, we know that occasionally our planet gets hit with a massive asteroid. You know, it's, it's currently believed that that's what wiped out the dinosaurs. Um, so even that just alone prevents some possibility of human extinction. So, you know, how can you put the probability that humans go extinct in the next 50 years at almost zero if we know that just asteroids alone could contri- potentially contribute more than, ze- you know, more than zero, certainly. Um, but then there's these other risks that um, beyond asteroids. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Hmm. I'm just looking at, at the figure here and you got people to estimate what was the likelihood of a particular kind of, of various kinds of disasters, uh, killing at least 10% of the human population in the next 50 years. And so you looked at a, at a broad audience online and then you also surveyed people involved in the effective altruism community. Mm-hmm. The interesting thing is, so just looking at some of the results here, uh, people thought there was an over 10% chance of climate change doing this. 
Um, but effective altruists thought it was more like 1%. And basically across the board, uh, looking at nuclear war, solar flare, maliciously created viruses, asteroids, uh, effective altruists are known for being really worried about catastrophic risks, but they thought basically all of these things were less likely than, than the general public did. Yeah, I thought that was very interesting. Um, that, you know, so, so the general public is actually thinks it's not that unlikely that for example, climate change will cause this massive disaster of 10% of humanity being wiped down in 50 years, or, um, you know, the nuclear war will cause that. Yet, they're not really worried about extinction. And effective altruists are actually less worried about these particular risks causing, I mean, they're still worried. I mean, you know, they still put these at reasonable probabilities, but they're, they seem to be a little bit less worried about them relative to the general population, but they're really worried about extinction, mm-hmm. um, at least relatively. So, um, I thought that was, that was quite interesting. In fact, we have this number that the effective altruists, their estimate for extinction was about 100,000 times the probability that that the other group put. 100,000 times? Yeah, I mean, it still so, wasn't a high so number, how, but... So that means that people must think that the risk of extinction is 0.0001%. Very, really? very, very low. Wow. I don't know what the risk is, but I'm pretty sure it's higher than that. <laughs> I suspect it's higher than that. Yeah, there's, a lot, there's a lot of new stuff going on all the time, and you're kind of opening Pandora's box uh, with all of the scientific discoveries that we're making. It's just the risk just kind of can't be that low because we're just not in such a stable state where we have a long history of experience with what we're doing now and knowing that it's safe. There are these kinds of risks that I, I like to think of as global time bombs, like that's my phrase, which is there are these risks that they seem to just get, be getting worse on the margin, and we know that they could have massive global negative consequences. So, you know, so, um, example would be runaway climate change, like the, as the world gets warmer, um, you know, there's some probability that like things are even worse than we thought they were, but certainly year by year we're polluting more and more. Um, we expect this to continue. Or nuclear war, you could imagine a situation where the dangers from nuclear war went down, but it seems like on the margin they're going up. And so these things that, that could potentially have this catastrophic disasters, they just seem to be increasing the probability. Yeah. It's interesting. The figure there for uh, for all of the groups was around 10% chance of a ma- major nuclear war in the next 50 years, which is uh, worryingly high. That's about 0.2% a year, I guess. Um, so some, something that potentially... Very, very worryingly high. Something yeah. that we should potentially be caring more about. And then you, you did have uh, the disagreement you might expect about uh, AI that, uh, that, that kills people. Uh, the uh, people involved in the effective altruism community had a median answer of a 10% probability on that. Right, and that's, uh, for, the general, that's for AI wiping out 10% of the population in the next right. 50 years. Yeah. Whereas the general population thought it was uh, 1%. Still, still concerningly high. I think I might, <laughs> I might, I might care if there was a new technology that had uh, that higher chance of causing causing mass death. And this is part of why I think one of the key issues here is actually understanding, like, think the way people think about probabilities. If you think there's a one percent chance that someone might one day build an in the next fifty years build an AI that could wipe out ten percent of the world's population, that's really big. A one percent is a really big number there, yeah. and we should be really worried about it. Yeah, I guess you wouldn't put all of our resources to solve that, but you'd at least want to have a hundred people or something working on that. Exactly. Yeah, more than more than five people. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, as is pretty obvious from all of the above, you've worked on a lot of different things in your career so far. Uh, how have you decided what to focus on? Well, you know, obviously, there's going to be a combination of like, okay, what what resources do I have now? What opportunities do I have now? And then also thinking about what long term goals I have. And for myself, you know, I'm a, I'm a mathematician. Um, I'm a technologist. And so building technology seems to me like the competitive advantage that I have for helping the world. Um, and then with regard to that, I'm actually, I'm not wedded to helping the world in, in one particular way. There's a bunch, I think there's so many important ways you can help the world. And I, you know, so my general approach is to try to learn about many powerful tools and so for by powerful tools, I mean things like under, deeply understanding machine learning, understanding math, um, understanding, like developing a better understanding of psychology and um, of, of study design. Each of these is a really powerful system that lets you model things, understand things, predict things, uh, build, and, and then build things. So computer science programming. So that a lot of what I've done is try to absorb these different powerful tools and then it's find ways to try to leverage them in the direction of achieving what I want to do in my life, which is trying to to massively help the world. Have you found it difficult to juggle doing so many different things at once? Um, I think there there's definitely drawbacks to doing multiple projects. Like obviously focus has has a big advantage. Um, however, I think that with my the way my particular brain works is 
it's quite unusual in this regard. And so my optimal number of projects is probably somewhere between five and 15 simultaneously. Um, and I find that actually working on many things at once, um, while of course it has disadvantages, it also has a lot of advantages for me, like having a very cross discipline approach, finding solutions that where I can apply one thing to another thing in a way that's sort of maybe unexpected or that people wouldn't necessarily realize. And of course that means I need a team because obviously I can't myself build, you know, yeah. 10 things at once, but so I need teams. And so I need to, you know, rather, rather than building directly, I'm going to be working with teams to build things. Do you think in general people jump too much between projects or, uh, or focus too much? You know, that's a really, that's a really tough question. Yeah. Um, I would say that it's very, very bad to jump between a lot of things within like a given hour, right? That's just, you know, the, the problem is a lot of things, they require putting stuff into the context of your brain, you get them into memory. And if you keep switching back and forth, you keep losing that context and it's not very efficient. Um, but if you have, you know, this two hour block, I work on this thing and then I switch to another two hour block, I work on that thing. That can actually be very productive and actually kind of gives, you know, you a rest from certain, way, certain ways of, of using your mind. And then you're now in other ways of using your mind. And I think find that actually very efficient. Is it helpful when you're working on so many projects that as your enthusiasm waxes and wanes between different projects, you can always just work on one that you're enthusiastic about at that moment? Yeah, that's that's really great. But there is a risk there that you quit. And so one of the, like for me, one of the, by far the most important things I ever learned about myself is how to get myself not to quit. And the way I do it, it's very simple. It won't work for everyone, but it is I involve another person in the project. And to me, that's incredibly motivating. Um, and it could be that it's my... It could be an employee. It could be it's a you know a co-founder, or it could be that it's a I think my thesis advisor for my PhD. But having another person there just keeps me motivated, and I don't want to let them down. I want to keep going, um, and so that's how I, I keep driving these things forward. So even if I don't have that much time to put into it every week, it keeps moving forward. How do you find all of these people to help you out with your with your projects? This is a fairly unusual strategy for people who are pursuing kind of personal interests to have so many assistants and people that you're managing and you know colleagues. Well, I mean, Sparkwave, you know, we uh, we you know, it's a company where this is explicitly uh, sorry explicitly the structure of Sparkwave. We have a bunch of products we're working on. We have about approximately eleven right now, depending on how you count. Um, each of the products is worked on by a, t- a small team. And they're kind of explorations. We're kind of like a research lab in that we try ideas, try building them, and see if there's a lot of promise there. Um, so I think a lot about, like, you know, how do I structure this? How do I recruit for these teams? Um, one thing that in, when it comes to recruiting that I really like is testing people. Try to give them work that's very related, uh, work or tests that are very related to the thing you're actually going to have them do. Um, because what happens is a lot of times people rely on resumes, which I do not think are a very reliable indicator, or they use interviews, which I also do not think are very reliable indicator. And there's a lot of evidence that suggests these are, while people believe in these very strongly, a lot of evidence says that these are not very reliable indicators of skill. And so I like to use, say, give people actual tests to do the work and then see if they're actually good. And I find that allows me um, to recruit people who are really talented, but you look at their resume, you wouldn't immediately say, wow, this person looks amazing. Uh, you know, people come from all kinds of different situations, different backgrounds. We talk about this in our career guide about how to how to get a job. Uh, we suggest just trying to impress the employer by doing doing the job before you're even hired. And uh, also, that's a very useful way for you to figure out whether you're actually good at, at, at doing that job. If you can do a work test, then you can figure out whether it has a good personal fit for you. Yep. Uh, how, do, how do you find these people? Personal networks? Um, well, been recruiting. So lately, I've mentioned I've been recruiting CEOs. I've uh, been doing that through personal networks, and the word has begun to get out. And now I have people contacting me pretty regularly um, with uh, saying, "Hey, I heard about what you're doing. It sounds really interesting." And so, essentially, um, we're looking for people who are really excited about doing a startup. They know they want to do a startup, but they don't have that idea yet. And so they're like, "Oh man, I don't know which idea to work on." And then they find us, and then they say, "Hey, we we kind of try to evaluate them." Uh, and then if we think they're sufficiently promising, we'll say, okay, let us look through our 11 products. You tell us about what you value, and we're going to see if we have something that's a really good fit for your values. Do you find that now you have to do a lot of management, that it's more difficult to find time to actually create things yourself? Uh, definitely things swing more in the direction, you know, for more and more in the direction of management and not creation. But I do try to keep some time for like direct creation, keep my hands in the work. And I think that that helps me deepen my understanding of the important things we're trying to do. For example, with a, before building a product, I want to actually be looking at that interface, thinking about the features, thinking about how a customer will flow through it. 
because that actually is so essential to building a good product. I can't just outsource that. I want to be involved in those processes. Yeah. You have a PhD in machine learning, which is a career option that we're pretty enthusiastic about. Uh, why did you decide not to continue in machine learning specifically? Well, I am uh, continuing in machine learning. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, some of our products use machine learning. Okay, so, interesting. Which but, ones? Uh, pr- probably ones that, that nobody knows about. No, right okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but the, so, you know, going back to this idea of powerful tools, like when I learned about something, when I, I learned about machine learning a long time ago before people really knew about it. And when I heard about it, I was like, wow, you know, I have to learn about this thing. This is just such a powerful tool. And so for me, I'm trying to bring all these powerful tools together and then say, how can we use, you know, let's say we collect five, six, seven of these really powerful tools. What's the right way to use them? What's the right combination to solve a particular problem? And because we aren't wedded to one set of tools, we might be able to find ways to solve problems that people haven't used before. Do you think other people should study machine learning? Do you share our enthusiasm? Should people go and get PhDs in this area? Um, machine learning is a very hot area. Like People are hiring really ferociously. I mean, obviously, I, you know, it's hard to say what will be like in five or ten years. But I think there's, there is reason to think that it, it's continuing to grow in popularity. And use, there's so many use cases of it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I think, it's a, um, I think there's a ton of uh, applications that will continue to be found. So, mm-hmm. I think, yeah. Some people are skeptical about the value of machine learning, at least in some cases. I've heard people say, you know, there's all these companies out there building these complicated machine learning models, but what they really need is just uh, linear regression. They just need <laughs> to draw a line through a bunch of dots that they've collected. Uh, do you think that's true? So it's funny because machine learning is like simultaneously one of the most over and under hyped fields. <laughs> um, as with many very valuable ideas, uh, you know, at first nobody knows what it is. Eventually people start finding out and then they get like super excited. But then a lot of, you know, some of the people who are excited don't actually really understand the thing. So they start saying, Oh, it can do this and it can do that. And, and this other thing when in fact they've actually gone beyond the capabilities of it. And so this is what's happened is a bunch of people are now trying to use machine learning for things that it's not really that great for or where there's actually just like much simpler solutions, uh, that would work better. And so you have all these companies that are like, we do machine learning for X, but actually machine learning is not the right solution. Um, so that's really true that it is overhyped in that sense. On the other hand, it is also an incredibly powerful set of technologies that solve real, can solve real problems. Um, and, you know, it's tough to know how it will develop. But right now, the, the pace of development is extremely rapid. You know, it could slow down, but if it keeps up at this pace, you know, you're going to see it being applied to, you know, so many more things. And it's already being applied in so many different ways. Yeah. We'll be able to automate Spencer, have someone who, uh, an AI that creates, uh, creates new companies all the time. Hopefully we can put that off for a few more years. <laughs> more broadly, uh, how has the way you've thought about your career changed over, over time, if it, if it has at all? Well, I think that, um, more and more I feel like, okay, I've got to get my hands dirty and actually be helping people, you know, uh, doing less meta stuff and like more, and by helping people, I don't mean this, like, talking one-on-one with the person i mean like building things where there's this really tangible value that you can see for this person um you know so i mean i think it makes sense as you're younger you're doing things that are more generally beneficial for your career or they build skills and i've done that for a long time and now i want to bring those skills together and really build valuable products Mm. Uh, is there any information that you could see causing you to really change your focus over the next few years? I guess if, if you became more concerned about artificial intelligence, could you potentially spend your time working on that problem? Well, you know, the way that I think about what we're trying to do at SparkWave is we're trying to create a company creating machine. Now, a company creating machine is, a, if you can do it, obviously it's incredibly hard, but if you can succeed at it, it's this massively powerful, useful thing for helping the world. Because those, a company creating machine could create companies in many different Industries are applied to many different things. And also maybe it could even be adapted to creating nonprofits or things like that, uh, where there's crossover. So if, if I can successfully build this infrastructure, then I would like to apply it across many areas. Um, and I expect that the areas of focus probably will change over time, but I'd like to use that same infrastructure if I can. Uh, a few months ago, we did a little bit of a project together. There was uh, some uh, disagreement in the community about uh, whether um, most people in society think that charities in the developing world uh, could save lives extremely cheaply. I actually suspected that uh, many people, perhaps most people, would think that um, developing world charities, in fact, weren't saving lives and that, uh, by and large, they, they just weren't effective. But there were some other people who thought, no, they're going to have an extremely optimistic view, perhaps a naively optimistic view, and uh, think that 
charities will be able to save lives for just a couple of dollars or maybe maybe a couple of hundred dollars. It turned out uh, you're a huge fan of empiricism, so you offered to, to settle this disagreement by by using the uh, the tools that you developed that we discussed earlier. And it turned out I was totally wrong. Uh, a typical respondent thought that uh, that among the most effective uh, charities, uh, they would be able to save a life in the developing world for for just a couple of dollars at most, you know, ten twenty dollars. And we think that the real figure is probably in the low thousands of dollars. But perhaps high thousand dollars, like three to three to seven thousand dollars, based on on GiveWell's research. And I'll put up a link to our blog post where where we discuss these results. But uh, it, it was just, I think, really good to just go out and collect the data. It wasn't wasn't that difficult, and we could we could settle that disagreement and then try to learn some lessons about how do you talk about these things uh, in a way that's not misleading. Yeah, the, you know, it's the power of science. Like once running a study is actually a rapid thing you can do. You're like, oh wait, we can just answer this question. We don't even speculate about it, and it's so it's actually really fun to do that. Um, uh, but uh, one thing that was I thought was super interesting about that study as well is that we compared people we compared what people said they thought the the typical charity could save a life for with the amount they thought the most cost effective charity could save a child's life for. And we specifically said in both cases for uh, in a in a poor country. Um, and the numbers were shockingly close together. People thought that the most cost effective charity is only a little bit better than the typical charity, which is also, I, I believe, very different than what your research has indicated. Yeah, uh, we tend to think that uh, among the, mo- the, the among the most effective charities, they might be like ten, or possibly even more times effective than than just a randomly allocated donation. So really, quite a large multiple. But yeah, in the sample, people didn't even think that they were twice as cost effective. So that. They saw quite small differences, and they thought that those differences were driven mostly just by how well the charity was run, whether they could cut costs and you know get get a lot done with, with an hour of staff time. Whereas we think most of those differences are driven rather by what kind of service or, or product that they're, they're offering people. Uh, so we think that there's very large differences between, say, providing bed nets versus you know other other healthcare treatments that might not be so effective or might be much more um, expensive to treat e- each person. And and that's the kind of place where you can. See See really large differences in, in cost effectiveness. I actually got, got the number slightly wrong. I've just pulled up the table here. Uh, and um, the median response for the cost to prevent one child from dying for a typical charity was, was $40. And for the most cost-effective charities, it was, it was $25. So uh, something like a hundredfold cheaper than, than what we would, uh, would think it is. Yeah, you know, it's funny about that, how uh, you, know, you got the number wrong first and then you corrected it. We actually just did a study about whether people can unforget numbers. And <laughs> we found some evidence that people actually Actually, like they're still influenced by this. So, we, so we're running a study recently where what we do is we give people fake facts about the world and we make them memorize them. We actually quiz them on the fake facts. Then we say, actually, everything we told you is just totally false. It was it was actually generated at random, which they were. We actually had like a random algorithm that either generated like two high ones or two no ones. So it was random whether what, what the number was. We said, ignore them completely. Now we want you to make estimates about these things. <laughs> But remember, don't use that information because it was totally ran- generated by a computer at random. And then we have to make the estimates and we can show that, in fact, their estimates are highly influenced yeah. by these fake numbers. So it's ca- kind of interesting. It's called yeah. anchoring or it's similar to anchoring. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. I, it's, I think what's going on there is, is perhaps a bit of uh, availability bias on my part that I was most stunned by these very low numbers. So they stuck in my head. And then I thought that. <laughs> so I can see here that the, the person at the 10th percentile, so someone who was relatively more optimistic, thought that it was uh, $5 and $2 for a typical versus most cost effective charity. And because that was more remarkable, I think, is what I remembered. Yeah, there you go. You did another similar survey to this to try to um, figure out people's attitudes towards uh, animal charity and uh, just uh, the, the welfare of animals in general, right? Right, right. Because I think w- one really interesting thing is um, the way people think about animals because many people care about animals and think it would be really bad to harm them. Yet, you know, in the factory farming system, it seems like a lot of animals are harmed. So we were interested in studying that apparent contradiction. What's going on? It, is it that people don't believe they're being harmed? Is it people believe animals don't feel pain? Maybe they only care about dogs and cats and not about other animals. So we wanted to investigate that. Yeah. So uh, personally, I'm I'm vegetarian, apart from eating uh, mussels, because I think that they're that they're not conscious. And you know, I've looked into it, and it seems just like the treatment of animals in in factory farms, in particular in the United States, is is extremely poor. So I look around at, at people in society uh, eating meat, and I think, well, they must think, I guess, that animals um, can't experience 
experience pain or that even if they do experience pain, it's, it's not morally bad, that they don't have a responsibility not to be basically funding the torture of animals? Was, was that what you found? So that's the really interesting thing. So when we asked people in our sample, do you think that animals can experience pain? And actually, before I tell the answer, okay. whoever is listening, I'd like you to actually make a prediction. What percentage of people say that they think animals can experience pain? Okay, well, the answer is 99% of them said yes. Okay, so they think they can experience pain. Well, maybe, what about, what about suffering? Because, you know, some philosophers had made this distinction that pain is not necessarily suffering. Well, it turns out they think 99% of people reported thinking that animals can suffer, too. Um, and then you can keep going. You can go down the series of questions trying to find the point at which people start saying that actually what they're doing is okay. Because, like, most people eat meat. And so, you know, where, at some point, presumably, they're going to start diverging and saying that their behavior is acceptable. Um, okay, so we asked, do you think it's wrong to hurt animals if the only reason you do it is to enjoy your life a little bit more? Which is basically the situation with, with meat consumption for, for the vast majority of people. So interestingly enough, eighty-eight percent of people said that it's wrong in that case. So, and the other, and then nine percent that said that they're that they're not sure. Only four percent of people were willing to say that that was all right. So then, you, then you know, well, okay, well, maybe it's about farm animals. Like maybe when we're saying herd animals, people are thinking about like dogs and cats. And in fact, indeed, uh, I don't have the numbers here, but when um, we ask about dogs and cats, like people think it's extremely bad to hurt dogs and cats. Okay, so we asked, do you think it's wrong to hurt farm animals? Uh, to my surprise, sixty-five percent of people in our sample said yes, and twenty-one percent said I'm not sure. So only thirteen percent said no. So actually, people think it is pretty wrong to hurt farm animals. It, look, it, it's a little bit baffling. It was, why would it be wrong to hurt a dog, but not wrong to hurt a pig? I mean, they're, they're both you know pretty similarly smart, you know, quite behaviorally similar as well. I, I suspect there's a bit of rationalization going on here, right? <laughs> but let, let's keep going. Okay, so then we asked. Okay, maybe it's something about food, right? So maybe maybe it has to do with like eating as a special category. So we asked, do you think it's wrong to hurt animals if you hurt them mainly because you enjoy the way they taste when you eat them, right? So it's a kind of a different, more specific twist on our on our question about is it okay to do it just because you enjoy your life a little more? And actually, that did change the numbers. So when we asked about is it okay to hurt them because to enjoy your life more, people said eighty eight percent said that was wrong. Whereas with the food case. Um, 50, only 53% said it was wrong and 20% right. I'm not sure. So we did get a significant reduction, but still the majority of people felt that it's wrong. Hmm. I feel like there's probably a contradiction between the two answers here, but uh, unless you think, I guess, that enjoying the taste of, of meat is not just improving your life a little bit. Maybe you think it's a huge improvement in your life. But Well, you know, it's interesting because we did a qualitative analysis, like having people explain a bunch of their answers. And one thing that we found is that people do put food in a special category um, for a few reasons. One of those is that they think it's essential. They think, well, it's, you know, I need to eat, therefore it's, um, it's more okay. Or they think, well, it's for health purposes and not, you know, so yes, I enjoy the taste, but also it's it's like making me healthy or giving me nutrients. And so I think that's part of what's coming yeah. into play here. I'd be a bit less surprised if the question was if it improved your health because you were you were eating meat. Uh, I mean, I think in most cases eating meat uh, doesn't really improve people's health. And uh, I'll see if I can uh, dig up some some research on that, that that we can link people to. But but the question was about just just the taste. But I, I suppose maybe they're conflating the two and just thinking about food in general as a special category. Yeah, well, you can imagine someone who might say like, well, I. Uh, you know, I'm going to eat healthier if I eat meat products because I enjoy the taste of like the healthy meat products more than the, you know, healthy vegetable products or something like that. So you can yeah. see how they can start getting kind of mixed together. Okay. And then what was the last question? Um, so the next one, uh, which I found especially interesting was, do you think that animals suffer a lot when they're raised on farms for our food? Mm -hmm. And this is where we started first, the first time we saw less than 50% agreeing. So it was 43% agreed and 46% said, I'm not sure. So, so, um, actually a lot of people are saying they're unsure about whether animals suffer a lot when they're raised on farms for food. And so I think this is where we begin to see people really saying, like beginning to say, well, what I'm doing maybe is okay because I actually don't know whether these animals are being harmed. But if you weren't sure and you thought it was incredibly wrong to hurt animals, uh, and you were buying meat, so effectively funding this treatment of animals, wouldn't you have like a huge responsibility to, to look into this? It's like, I'm, I'm doing this thing and I think it's wrong to, you know, cause enormous harm to children. And I just, I've never looked into whether it uh, causes enormous harm to children. It might. I just don't know, but I'm going to pay for it anyway. It's, it's quite an odd position, don't you think? Well, I think it's very admirable in those kinds of situations to look into these things. However, I think it's, it's very common not to. Like, for example, take, you know, uh, sweatshop labor. You know, people have different 
attitudes about whether it's harmful or not. But for those who think it's harmful, I think most of them have not looked into whether the clothes that they buy mm. are coming from sweatshops. And it is, it is very common. So, yeah. you know, whether, you know, I certainly think it's admirable to investigate, but I think people tend to copy the behavior of those around them. So if most people aren't doing it, they may, you know, feel off the hook or just never even think to do it. Well, I'll see if I can dig up the, the most authoritative thing, uh, the most even-handed thing I can find about uh, animal welfare uh, in, in farms in the US and perhaps other countries and, and link people to that so that they can they can decide for themselves if currently they're, they're also in this class of, of not being sure. So at that at that final point, we had 43% of people say that they thought uh, animals suffer a lot when they're raised on farms for food, which I guess is much larger than the number of, of vegetarians. I suppose you could have had uh, some of those people who think that they do suffer a lot might have thought it was not wrong. So we don't know exactly exactly what fraction of people's answers uh, from from these figures uh, suggest that, that they probably shouldn't be funding meat ideally or meat production ideally. Well, you know, it's interesting. So reading people's qualitative responses, uh, it can really flesh out these kind of quantitative numbers. And so one thing we found, there were some people in the study that said, wow, like this study is making me really rethink mm-hmm. what I'm doing and like I'm feeling really bad. Uh, so that was interesting. So that could be part of the 43%. Mm-hmm. Um, there are others that say, you know what, like I just find it's really, really hard for me, like... I want to go vegetarian, but I can't do it. You know, it's a willpower issue. There's willpower um, or practicality stuff. So I think there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. yeah, I suppose I, I, I shouldn't be too hard on the people who said that they're not sure, because at least they're not going full rationalization and kidding themselves and saying that uh, farms must be fine. They're at least open to the possibility that that they're not. Yeah. Um, one thing I'll just add is, uh, as I said earlier, I um, I eat mussels, uh, which because I've looked into their nervous system and I've looked into how they're raised, and I and I think that there's a very low probability that that eating mussels is is an immoral thing to do. So if you're in, in this group of people who think that uh, you know you should eat some meat or at least eat some seafood in order to be in order to be healthy, that's that's an option where you can eat uh, kinds of meat that cause uh, very little or potentially uh, no suffering for, for the amount of meat that you're consuming. All right. Is there anything finally you wanted to say? Uh, uh, we'll, we'll stick up links to even in, even some other interesting things that you've uh, done because uh, you just uh, live such an interesting uh, intellectual life. So I, wanna, <laughs> I want people to be able to dabble in that. Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that. Cool. Well, my guest today has been Spencer Greenberg. Thanks for coming on the show. Uh, thanks so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for joining. If you'd like to help me out, then share this episode with your friends or leave us a review on iTunes. And if you'd like to actually work on solving any of the problems that we talked about today, like animal welfare or global catastrophic risks, you should definitely apply for free one-on-one coaching from the team here. The application only takes a few minutes and the link is in the show notes and associated blog post. We really can do a lot to help out most people. Thanks so much. Talk to you next week.